Okay, so welcome back. Today we are going to start a series where we design and build the circuit you see here, which allows us to calculate and monitor and plot the frequency of the 120 volt AC wall outlet voltage that is provided to us by the power company. So we can monitor and uh, chart that data, that frequency data over a long period of time, uh, minutes, hours, days, to see what the trends are. And we're going to look at some of the um, government regulations, at least here in the U.S., that define what range of frequencies the uh, power company has to provide. We're going to do some design and simulation of the circuit in LT Spice, which is a wonderful and free um, bit of simulation software that allows you to simulate electronic circuits. We're also going to look at taking the data that we send to our computer via the Arduino you see here. Uh, we're going to be streaming that in Excel, uh, doing a live streaming of the data so we can do a live chart. So I encourage you to hang around and if you like any of these videos, I got like 150 or 160 videos on different technical hardware and software topics. Uh, if you like them, I encourage you to like them and subscribe and hit the bell notifications. And most of all, uh, it would be very helpful if you could let others know that we're here. Like I say, I've got a lot of videos on a lot of different subjects and it would be great to have more people aware of these videos so they can check them out. So let's start designing this system and figure out what we're going to do, how we're going to do it. And very importantly, what results are we going to expect? Because that's very important whenever you're designing something to know what the expected results are. Otherwise, you can get garbage, not really realize that you made a big mistake. First of all, what is frequency? Of course, um, we're going to be measuring wall outlet in the U.S., the frequency of the sine wave coming out of your wall outlet. And that's going to be about 60 cycles per second, also called 60 hertz. If there are 60 cycles in one second, then one cycle occurs, one cycle, this is one cycle, in one sixtieth of a second, or 0 0.016666 seconds, which is 16.67 milliseconds. So it's basically this repeating sinusoidal waveform that occurs 60 times in a second. And we gotta, uh, we're going to have to measure this frequency somehow. So how are we going to measure it? Well, um, that's a good question. Um, 60 cycles per second, we could somehow count how many cycles per second are happening with our waveform. Um, how would we do that? Well, uh, you could count the number of positive pulses per second, I suppose. So you see a positive pulse, and that happens once every cycle. So we could just somehow say, okay, I see a positive pulse, that's one. Another positive pulse, that's two. Um, you may be able to get away with that. The problem is, um, say you've got 60.3 cycles per second. Um, 60.3 hertz, you're going to have a fraction of a complete cycle. You're going to have three tenths of a cycle. How are you going to measure that if you're just looking at the positive pulses? Uh, it gets kind of complicated. Now, the other thing you can do is count the number of seconds in one cycle. So you can somehow figure out, here's a cycle. How many seconds does that take? And that gives you one over the cycles per second, right? So cycles per second is one over seconds per cycle. So we're basically going to figure out how many seconds uh, does it take for this one repeatable sine wave cycle to occur. And that's the, the way we're going to approach this because it turns out it's quite a bit easier to do it this way, to figure out how many seconds per cycle and then invert that to get the frequency. How are we going to do that? We're going to use an Arduino Nano. And here is the Nano. And we are going to use some very nice features of this chip here, which is the main processor of the Nano. And the other, I think most of the other Arduinos. Uh, the AT Mega 328, you can see here, AT Mega 328, has got some very nice capabilities that are similar to what you might see in a desktop computer or a laptop. And it will allow us to measure uh, fairly easily 
how many seconds in one cycle, and then we can invert that to get cycles per second. To do this, we're going to deal with what are called events, interrupts, and timers. And if you've ever done any software programming on a regular computer, you're probably very familiar with this, events, interrupts, and timers, because it's a very, very important and very, very powerful functionality that allows you to specify a certain event that's occurring and you can do a function whenever that event happens. So what does that all mean? Well, what we can do is we can take our 60 hertz sine wave and if we can convert that into a square wave like this blue square wave, one of the great things about the AT Mega 328 and, and any computer basically is that it can detect the rising edge, which is here on the left, this going from negative to positive uh, very quickly. It's called a rising edge. It can detect that, and when that occurs, it can do an interrupt. And an interrupt basically says, hey, um, this rising edge occurred. Uh, I know you want me to keep track of it, so I just saw it, so go ahead and do whatever code you were going to do whenever a rising edge occurs. You can also do it on a falling edge, which you see over here, but we're going to choose a rising edge. You can toss a coin, decide what you want. And basically, we can use this rising edge to start a timer. Now, it's important if we're going to measure frequency, um, these rising edges must occur exactly one cycle apart. So we'll talk about this, but you know, the idea is I get a rising edge, I start a timer, and then the timer goes only for exactly one cycle and then shuts off and then starts another timer, all right? So you got to make sure that these rising edges are exactly one cycle apart. But that's basically what we're going to do. We're going to convert to a square wave somehow. Uh, the Arduino is going to be fed this square wave. And it's going to be on the lookout for a rising edge. And when it sees a rising edge, it will, it will run some code that we tell it to run whenever it sees a rising edge. And that code will just start a timer that will count how many uh, seconds are between consecutive rising edges, which tells us how many seconds in one cycle. Now, we don't necessarily need to have a rising edge at exactly the zero crossing. Right? We can have a rising edge that occurs someplace in the sine wave as long as the next rising edge occurs exactly the same place, relatively. Because what we care about is the difference between the two rising edges, making sure that that's equal to one period or one cycle of the sine wave. So you can start to think about how we're going to do that. Maybe we can have some circuit that says, Okay, if the sine wave is lower than, say, if the value of the sine wave is lower than, say, 3 volts, I will put out a negative square wave. And as soon as it gets above 3 volts, it'll go positive. And as long as it stays above 3 volts, it'll be positive. And here it's dropping below 3 volts, it'll go back negative. So you can start to see what type of circuitry you might use. Uh, maybe a reference voltage and a comparator, but really the important thing is that we have uh, rising edges that occur exactly one cycle apart. So here's kind of a picture of what we're going to have. We're going to have a square wave that we're going to generate from the sine wave. Uh, the Arduino is going to take that square wave, detect the rising edge, and start a timer. In our case, we're going to use a 2 megahertz timer built into the AT Mega 328. Actually, it's a 16 megahertz timer. We're going to drop it down to 2 megahertz. But basically, this is our picture of our timer going along. We start the timer, and it's going to have counts uh, for the entire cycle. Now, if you do the math, a 2 megahertz timer, um, how many counts will a 2 megahertz timer see? in one cycle, or 16 milliseconds, and the answer is about 33,333, right? So 2 megahertz in 0 0.016667 seconds 
gives you about three, uh, 33,333 counts. So that's kind of what we're going to expect for an exactly 60 hertz waveform. So now that we have kind of an idea of how we're going to approach this, um, we need to talk about what we're going to expect for results. That's very, very, very important when you design something uh, because you can get results that are totally garbage, but you don't know that they're garbage because you haven't defined your expectations, what's going to be reasonable numbers to get on the output. So we're going to look at what kind of numbers we're going to expect for frequency. So I'm going to use this analogy. Uh, let's say you're driving your car along a flat level road and you're going 60 miles an hour. Let's say you then encounter a hill and you start going up the hill. What's, gonna, what's the car going to do? Well, naturally, the car is going to start to slow down. Why is it going to slow down? Well, when you're going along at 60 miles an hour on a level road, the gas pedal was at a certain position feeding gas into the engine and the engine was going along producing enough power to make the car go 60 miles an hour on a level road. However, when you start going up a hill, the gas pedal is still only making enough power to make the car go 60 miles on a level road, but now it's got a lot more load. You're asking it to do a lot more. It's, it's a lot more difficult. If you've ever tried to walk up a hill, it's more difficult. You need more power to get up the hill. But your gas pedal is in the same position, so naturally it's going to slow down initially. So you need to insert more power into the engine by pushing down the gas pedal to make it speed up. But we know that in the interim, from the time you start going up the hill till the time that you press the gas pedal and the engine actually responds could be many seconds. And in the meantime, your engine is going to slow down. So that's a very important concept to understand when we talk about frequency because the exact same concept applies on the power system with frequency of the sine wave, the voltage that you see at your wall outlet. So here is the analogy. I've got a big power plant. It's got some spinning generators in it. And those generators are generating sinusoidal voltages at 60 hertz and they're feeding it out along the power system. And it's coming to a substation like this, which is a distribution point. And the substations connect the power and distribute it out to the customers who use the power. So the analogy is very close between the engine in your car and the generator at the power plant and the load being how difficult it is for the car to travel up a hill. So I've got my engine in the, in the power plant, and as I add more load on the system, the engine in the power plant has to put on more gas and speed up in order to maintain the same power to the load. So if suddenly, for example, it's going along happy, producing 60 hertz, and it's got a fixed amount of load, if suddenly a big load comes on, like a big industrial plant comes on, and suddenly it's like you're going up a hill, these generators are going to slow down initially, and they're going to go to a lower frequency. They're slowing down, their frequency is lower, the number of cycles per second is lower because it's slowing down, the generators are spinning slower, and the frequency is going to drop. So now the generators have to say, hey, wait a minute, the frequency is getting too low. I need to speed up just like you need to press on the gas pedal. So the internal circuitry on the generators is going to add more gas to the power plant and it's going to speed up and the frequency is going to return close to 60 hertz. Uh, the same thing applies. What if suddenly all this load at this uh, substation gets disconnected? Suddenly the power plant is going to be producing all this power, but there's suddenly no load and it's going to speed up until it says, wait a minute, I'm going too fast. There's no load and I'm going to have to slow down. Just like if you're going downhill, suddenly you have to put on the brakes. So it's very, very similar in concept to um, the load on your engine in your car and how much power is being put into the engine. So we need to keep in mind this analogy because it's going to be very important to figure out what we can expect in terms of frequency of the voltage at our wall outlet. So here is a diagram. It looks kind of complicated, but it's pretty straightforward. 
And what this is basically saying is it's very, very important for your utility and the power system to maintain a frequency very, very close to 60 hertz under normal conditions. Because if you don't, bad things can happen to the equipment, bad things can happen to the system. So it's very important that you maintain frequency very close to 60. Uh, in other parts of the world, it might be 50 hertz, but in the US, it's 60. And it's important that you understand the limitations on what the normal frequency is, because if you go through and you design your frequency meter here and you do your code and your hardware, and you're getting results that show that the frequency is like 55 hertz, you've got a big problem because as this diagram shows, you're rarely, if ever, going to see frequencies that low. So what this says is, um, as you get down, here's 60 hertz, as you get down to near 59 hertz, what this says is your equipment on the power system has to detect that and it has to say, hey, if it's getting down near 59, above 59, something's very bad and we need to uh, turn off some of the load because the generators or your en car engine is going uphill and it's, going, it's slowing down too much. So we need to drop some of the load so the, so the generators can speed back up and stay near 60 because it's very important that you stay near 60 for a bunch of reasons. So what this says is um, if it gets down near 59 hertz, um, you're going to have to start cutting off some of the load on the generators. Some of the customer load has to trip off, disconnect, or else you're going to have problems. And if it's getting down to 58, you have to do it real fast. Here's 10 seconds, here's one second. So at 58, you have to, you know, in a few seconds, you better cut off a bunch of load. So again, it's very important that you stay near 60. And that means that if you're going to be measuring frequency, um, it has to be accurate to very close tolerance around 60. If your frequency meter that you develop here is plus or minus one hertz, that's garbage. That's not going to help you because under normal conditions, you're not going to see 59 hertz, which is 60 minus 1 hertz, or you're not going to see 61. That's under very abnormal conditions. So you're going to want an output that is accurate to, you know, maybe a tenth of a hertz or better. So this is very important to understand what the real world is and compare it with what your results are to show whether your results are garbage and you've done something completely wrong. Okay. So Again, we want results that are right near 60. Um, we're going to want very close tolerance to 60. And if we get something far out of range, uh, we better know about it and we better fix our design. So here's our task. Um, first of all, we need to get a low voltage sine wave that's uh, reflecting the, the wall outlet 120 volt RMS. And what we're going to look at is this device that we used in our previous series where we did a, a RMS voltage uh, measuring or monitoring system. And it was a little uh, very inexpensive device called a ZMPT-101B that basically converts your wall outlet voltage into a low voltage sine wave. And we're going to look to see if we can use this in this design to actually measure frequency. Then we need to convert whatever we get for a low voltage sine wave into a square wave so that we can use the nano, the ATmega328's ability to detect a positive rising or falling square wave edge to initiate some code. So how are we can, gonna convert a sine wave into a square wave? We gotta figure that out. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna come up with a very simple design and I'm going to use LT Spice to um, check to see if we're good and make sure that our design works. Uh, and then once we have that square wave that, that models the incoming sine wave, we're going to feed that to a special pin on the Arduino, which is called a digital interrupt pin. And that interrupt is going to generate a um, event that runs some code in the Arduino. And we're going to have to generate a function or a method that configures that interrupt and starts a timer to time how many um, seconds in each cycle. 
And importantly, we're going to, once we get that, we're going to have to make sure our results are accurate because as we said, you want something very close to 60 Hertz under normal conditions. We're going to calibrate that with a signal generator. And we showed that in the previous series on the RMS voltage sensor and also with a multimeter. So we want to make sure that um, we've got some accurate results. So that's the plan. In the next video, we're going to start looking at putting together components, some hardware and figure out how we're going to do this uh, practically on the bench. And here's an example of LT Spice we're going to use to, to simulate the design to get it to where we want to be. So I encourage you to hang around for the next part in the series. And again, I encourage you to like, subscribe, hit the bell notifications, and also let others know that we're here. Otherwise, take care and have a really good day. Thanks.